Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current, and since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent-looking stream could be such a danger. So, my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. Sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal-clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off-limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. No definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisan Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. 
Even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. Let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monoon and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock and sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water, creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part? These explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert, because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below. The Baltic Sea Anomaly. In 2011, a diving team came down to the bottom of the northern part of the Baltic Sea. They went on a treasure hunt, but what they came upon was a pretty weird object. When they took photos and showed them to others, many believed it was a sunken spaceship of another civilization. Other people thought that some natural causes formed the object, but the metals inside the structure definitely couldn't have been formed naturally. Now, some scientists even believe it was something that appeared way back in the Ice Age. Maybe it was even a meteorite that ended up trapped under ice back then. A maelstrom is a whirlpool, some sort of a powerful rotational current that forms when two currents collide and create a circular vortex. Even fearless Vikings were afraid of maelstroms because those were forces so powerful that they could sink large ships. These whirlpools remain dangerous even today, but luckily, not for big modern ships that are large enough to withstand the power of maelstroms. But a cruise ship that gets into a maelstrom usually faces massive waves that can rock even big vessels from side to side pretty intensely. A maelstrom can be so strong, it can turn into some sort of an underwater black hole. Yep, black holes are not only present in the cold expanse of space, you can find them here on our home planet too swirling in the oceans. They're similar to those in space, since they're compacted so tightly that nothing they trap can escape. Underwater black holes often span up to 93 miles in diameter. 
And if you got into one of those, you probably wouldn't even know it. These black holes act like vortices, but because of their size, even professionals can hardly see their boundaries. Here's something relaxing. Next time you go to the beach, pay attention, and maybe you'll see an optical phenomenon called the green flash. You can see it shortly after sunset or right before sunrise. It occurs when the sun is almost completely below the horizon, while its rim, the upper one, is still visible. For just a second or two, that upper edge of the sun will appear green. It's because you're looking at the sun through thicker parts of the atmosphere as it's moving down in the sky. As it's dipping below the horizon, light refracts, or bends, in the atmosphere and gets dispersed. Wait for a clear day with no clouds or haze on the horizon to see this phenomenon better. You've been looking forward to a nice swim, only to realize that the water in the ocean is red? Better avoid going in. Florida is known for its red tides. It occurs when the concentration of specific microscopic algae is higher than normal. Thousands of species of algae in marine and fresh waters are mostly harmless to animals and humans. They even help us, since they're an important source of oxygen. But some, like the algae that makes the ocean red, can be extremely dangerous for marine animals, like sea turtles, fish, and seabirds. This kind can grow out of control and produce neurotoxins harmful to humans, especially those who have some respiratory issues. Such people should avoid red tide areas, especially when winds are strong enough to push the algae toward the shore. Volcanoes can spew poisonous gas, ash, and red-hot lava. Those are the most obvious dangers most of us already know about. But submarine volcanoes can be very tricky in their own way. Sometimes, when they're located in shallow waters, they reveal their presence by blasting debris of rock and steam high above the surface. Since submarine volcanoes are surrounded by an unlimited supply of water, they can behave differently from those on land. When they erupt, seawater gets into active submarine vents. Lava can be spreading across a shallow sea floor, or sometimes even flowing into the sea from land volcanoes. When in water, it may cool down so quickly that it shatters into rubble and sand. So, there are large amounts of volcanic debris left there. You know those popular black sand beaches in Hawaii? That's how they formed. Hot lava and powerful eruptions certainly don't sound safe, but submarine volcanoes in deeper waters are equally dangerous. Even though they're not necessarily erupting, they produce pockets of bubbles. These bubbles reduce the density of the surrounding waters, which can even sink ships. The worst thing is that when you look at the surface of the ocean, you can't understand something's wrong. But at the same time, tiny bubbles are there, causing ships to lose buoyancy and with very little warning. A cross sea is a rare phenomenon, beautiful to observe, but also very dangerous. It's when you see square waves, which are more common in shallow parts of the ocean. That's something you can often see in France or on certain beaches of Tel Aviv, but it can also happen in many coastal areas across the world. A cross sea occurs when two wave patterns travel at oblique angles. They form this checkerboard-like pattern. It mostly happens when two swells meet, or when a swell pushes waves in one direction while a strong wind pushes them in another. These square waves can be dangerous for swimmers and boaters. The waves produced by strong ocean currents can be pretty unpredictable and tall, sometimes up to almost 10 feet. This phenomenon is sometimes called white walls. These waves can be so powerful that they can turn over even big boats. If you fill a clear glass with some ocean water and take a closer look, you'll see it's full of very small particles. Seawater contains dissolved salts, fats, algae, proteins, detergents, and other bits of artificial and organic matter. If you shake that glass, you'll see tiny bubbles forming on its surface. That's how sea foam forms when waves and winds agitate the ocean. When you see thick sea foam, 
Algal blooms might have caused it. When big blooms of algae fall apart in the sea, large amounts of that matter move in the direction of dry land. Most kinds of sea foam aren't dangerous to humans, but when blooms of algae fall apart, it can have a negative impact on both the environment and people. For example, when sea foam bubbles pop, the toxins they contain get released into the air, and they can irritate your eyes or cause some other health issues. You can see a tidal bore in the areas where a river empties into a sea or an ocean. It's a powerful tide that goes against the current and pushes up the river. A tidal bore falls into a category of something called the surge, which is a sudden change in depth. A tidal bore is a positive surge, which means it pushes up a river, making it much deeper. A negative surge is when the river suddenly becomes very shallow. You won't see tidal bores everywhere. The river must be fairly shallow with a narrow outlet to the sea. The place where the sea and the river meet must be flat and wide. Also, the area between low and high tide must be at least 20 feet across. Of course, there are some exceptions, like the Amazon River, the world's largest one. The mouth of the Amazon is not narrow, but the river experiences tidal bores. That's because its mouth is shallow and has many sandbars and low-lying islands. The tidal bore is so strong there that the river doesn't even have a delta. Its sediment goes directly into the Atlantic Ocean, where fast-moving currents take it away. A tidal bore is often unpredictable and can be extremely rough. In many cases, it changes the color of the river from greenish or blue to brown. It can damage vegetation or even tear trees out of the ground. So, recreation sports like kayaking and river surfing can be hazardous in these areas. Even if you just want to take a look at a tidal bore, be careful. Tidal waves can sweep over lookout points and drag whatever or whoever is there into the churning river. Ah, the beauty of nature all around you. The fresh air and days and days of meditative rest far away from civilization ahead of you. But you've been walking for quite some time to get this far, and now it's time to set up camp. The woods around are dense, and there's no suitable place to put up your tent. Then you notice a nice green patch completely devoid of trees and only sprinkled with some low-growing bushes. Well, you go there, smug about your find, and get to work on the tent. The ground is unusually soft and smooth, but that doesn't bother you too much. All the better! The pegs go into the soil like a knife into butter. By the time you're done, it's dark already. So you get inside the tent and crawl into your cozy sleeping bag. You wake up from a creepy feeling that something's not right. You feel wet? You start wriggling inside your bag and, yes, it's almost completely soaked from below. You rush out of the tent as quickly as you can and see that it started to sink into the ground. Turns out you've set up camp on a swamp. And you've been lucky, too. Swamps aren't always obvious. Sometimes you won't even see them until you're knee-deep in muck and trouble. Getting out of there can be tricky as well. The moss and roots create a soft padding that's slowly pulling you under. And when you try to raise your feet, you might end up without your boots. Telling a forest swamp is fairly easy when you know what to look for. If you're in a dense thicket and see a lush, sunlit glade where nothing but moss and an occasional bush grows, chances are high it's a swamp. You can also check it by stepping lightly on this serene ground. If it feels springy, better stay away. One other thing the swamp can be dangerous for is, surprisingly, a forest fire. If you stay too close to a swamp and start a campfire, it might catch on, especially if there's a strong wind. Swamps and marshes are chock full of tar hidden underneath the layers of water and moss. When it starts to burn, extinguishing it is nearly impossible. Always keep a safe distance from any swamp before starting a campfire. Another common mistake while breaking camp in the wild is not looking up. Let's say you found some solid ground to put up the tent, cleared it from all the nasty cones and stones, and made sure there aren't any anthills close by. You don't want anything to creep inside your sleeping bag at night, do you? 
the spot you've chosen is perfect. And the tree your tent is leaning to protects you from the wind and rain. You set up for the night, turning off your camping light, and suddenly, your tent is thrashing as if a wild beast has attacked you. Bewildered, you scrambled out and see a huge branch has fallen on top of your tent. The worst thing about this is that you would have seen it coming if only you'd looked up before setting up camp. Half-broken and rotten branches are easy to spot, and it's never a good idea to put your tent straight beneath them. Such a thing can break off at any moment, and you'll be lucky if it doesn't tear your tent and harm you. You know, crunch. Dozens of tourists make this mistake every year and often pay dearly for it. Looking up will also help you make sure there are no wasp nests or spider nets above you. These might prove even worse than a branch, because wasps don't like to be disturbed, and spiders may turn out to be venomous. Now, if you see a beautiful river and decide to break camp on its banks, pay special attention to where exactly you put up your tent as well. If you stay too close to the water, especially in spring or fall, chances are you'll find yourself afloat in the middle of the night. Always check the weather forecast for the day and the night after. If there's a chance of rain, better stay away from any bodies of water, especially rivers. The rain might raise the water level in it and make it burst its banks, drowning your little camp and ruining your vacation. But even if you're far from water, rain could spoil it for you. Say you're once again deep in the forest and tree crowns are protecting you from the weather. Precipitation still gets to the forest floor, but at least it's not as bad as in the open. The next night, when you set up camp in another place, you feel the ground is soft and springy. It's not a swamp, though, just the last night's rain has loosened the soil. If you're in such a spot, better move to somewhere solid. Thing is, soft and loose ground might start creeping out from under you at any point. This movement isn't as dangerous as when you're in a swamp, but the pegs of your tent might come loose too, and you'll end up buried underneath a pile of rugs that used to be your tent. And if you decided to set up your camp in a cozy-looking valley, and the rain starts falling when you're already there, well, prepare for a nice floating trip. All the water will naturally go down and into your shelter, eventually finding its way under your tent. No wonder you'll find yourself knee-deep in rainwater when you wake up. Oh, what a great spot for taking a bit of rest after a long walk. It's on a hilltop, so there's no water nearby, the sun's shining, and not a single tree to block it out. Sunbathing here's gotta be fabulous! Well, it seems this way for the first few hours. But when you stay here long enough, you'll see the error of your decision. Direct sunlight on your tent can make it hot in a matter of hours due to the materials it's made of and you'll feel it on your skin as soon as you crawl inside. Let's just say you won't want to stay in there for long until it's night and the tents cool down at least. Same thing with the wind. In an open spot, gusts can reach crazy speeds, and if you haven't been careful while hammering down the pegs, you might say goodbye to your tent sooner than you'd like. It's best to find a spot near a tree that would protect you both from the sun and the wind. Still, don't get tempted to camp near a lone tree when the weather forecast isn't in your favor. Both sunny and rainy weather are okay, but if there's a serious storm coming, a single standing tree will serve as a lightning rod. It's not hard to imagine what may come if lightning strikes a tree you're camping under. Hey, you might get a charge out of it! When winter camping, the weather can be even more treacherous. Remember what I said about direct sunlight? Forget it. In winter, it's best to have the sun shining on your tent. The cold might get to you no matter how cool and expensive your tent is, and the winds are generally much more vicious in the cold season. Direct sunlight will help you cope with much of the cold. One of the more common mistakes hikers make is starting a campfire too close to the tent. Again, the material of the tent conducts heat very well, and it's a good thing when it's warm. But it also catches on fire easily. Sometimes, one spark is enough to burn your shelter to cinders. Make sure there's enough room between your tent and the campfire, and never leave your fire unsupervised. When you go to sleep, it's a rule to extinguish the fire so that you don't wake up to a blazing inferno around you. 
Insects can ruin even the most exciting hike. Mosquitoes, ants, ticks, and other pesky bugs can find their way into your tent wherever you are, so make sure you protect yourself from them. Use skin repellents when you go outside and put an anti-insect spiral next to the entrance to your tent. Don't put it too close or inside, though. The smell is irritating, and it can also cause a fire. To avoid the best part of mosquitoes, and especially ticks, try to stay away from lakes, ponds, and dense forests where swamps may occur. Skeeters reproduce in still water, so areas around such pools are replete with the winged pests. But they have a hard time flying when there's some wind, so choosing an open spot is your best bet to get rid of them. Don't let them bug you! This spiky tree knows how to shoot, so you better stay away from it. It's called a sandbox tree, and you can find it in Amazonia. Initially, its seeds are formed in the shape of a small pumpkin. As time goes by, they harden and mature. But here comes the fun part. Just as they reach peak maturity, the seeds pop and shoot out at a speed of 150 miles per hour. They can even reach distances of 60 feet. That's what makes it so risky to be in their way during the blast process. Not to mention the seeds are poisonous too. Sure, some trees don't grow completely upright, but a tree that's altogether bent, with its branches even touching the ground, is a sight not to be missed. Such a tree, called the El Arbol de la Sabina, grows in Spain. Its shape depends on the wind, as the tree bends in its direction. As a result, not only does it often have a weird shape, but it can also change it completely during different times of the year. This flexible tree can reach more than 26 feet in height and tends to grow in the most improbable of locations, like on rocks. Now, how about a tree that's as old as dinosaurs? Discovered in 1994, the Wallamy pine tree species can be seen in the Blue Mountains of Sydney, Australia. It dates back to over 200 million years, so it's easy to believe dinosaurs might have even roamed around it. Since these trees are endangered, and only 100 exhibits exist to this day in the wild, the scientists don't feel like disclosing their location. They want to make sure the trees are well-preserved. Also, they're important for science, as studying them may help us uncover new information on the Earth's past. The bark of the tree can teach us many different things, like different temperature periods or exposure to various chemicals. The tree of life gets its name because it's able to withstand difficult conditions and actually thrive. Located in the desert outskirts of Bahrain, the Prosopis cineraria has a very deep root system, which allows it to survive in the scorching heat. The scientists still can't find out how it manages to get sufficient water. It's so special that it gathers over 50,000 tourists each year. La India Dormida in Panama is a mountainous area that's shaped like the body of a sleeping girl. It's part of a bigger, mysterious region called La Val de Anton, one of the largest inhabited dormant volcanoes in the world. And it has some pretty weird trees, too. Square ones. Even the rings of these trees, meaning the interior of their trunks, are the same shape, with sharp edges, sometimes even at a perfect 90-degree angle. Researchers have tried to piece together why these trees grow in this particular shape. They even tried taking samples of some of the trees and planting them elsewhere, to see if they retain that shape. It wasn't the case, so it's clear that the odd shape of the trees has something to do with the valley itself. Some people believe that a local farmer might have originally planted the trees in boxes, forcing the trees to grow like that, to reduce lumber waste, since round trees often end up being cut in sharp angled pieces. One of the oldest and biggest trees in the world is found in the Sequoia National Park of the United States. It's called General Sherman and stretches at 275 feet. It's almost as big as the Statue of Liberty. Its circumference is equally as impressive, as near the ground, it is around 102 feet around. As for its age, we can only guess it to be between 2,300 and 2,700 years. That's an old tree! <laughs> there are a lot of beautiful species of trees out there, but none as striking as the rainbow eucalyptus found in the Philippines. It almost looks hand-painted because of its multicolored layers of bark. This tree also shades its layers irregularly, 
which means it shows a lot of colors at once, from green to blue, then purple to orange, and then finally reaching brown. It's not used for decorating purposes, but rather for paper manufacturing. Located in Namibia is a tree that's also weird in shape and pretty dangerous, the bottle tree. Okay, in terms of shape, it's pretty self-explanatory, with a round trunk that narrows down toward the top. But the milky sap harvested from the tree is extremely poisonous. Legend has it that local hunters used to dip their arrows in it for added efficiency. It does look really beautiful during bloom season, with flowers that grow in pink and white with a red center. Now, to see a crooked tree every now and then isn't so special. But to see a whole forest of them, you'd have to travel to the Polish town of Grafino. Near it, there is a forest made out of 400 oddly shaped trees. They've been curved with mechanical intervention. They didn't just grow like that, but their purpose remains a mystery to this day. Some have said it's because the wood from the trees was intended for furniture, or even for the construction of boats. But either way, the forest was eventually abandoned. A silk cotton tree has taken over the ancient Ta Prom temples of Cambodia, creating a spectacular view. The massive branches of the silk cotton trees were free to grow over the structures for ages, going back as far as the 12th century. The temples have been restored and are accessible to tourists. The dragon's blood tree grows in the Canary Islands of northwest Africa. Locals used to say that once a dragon passes away, it transforms into a tree. Standing at an impressive 50 feet in length, the tree is named like that due to its red sap, which can be harvested from the bark. The red substance to this day is used for dyes and in medicine. One of the biggest, oldest, and most impressive trees in the world is the Sunland Baobab tree. It's 72 feet high and has a circumference of 155 feet. It's located in South Africa. What makes it even more spectacular is the fact that it is naturally hollow inside. So, a small lounge was set up inside the tree back in 1933. It initially could support up to 20 individuals, but it can now host up to 60 people. Not to mention, the tree dates back over 6,000 years. The silver birch tree spread across Scandinavia and Northeast Europe and found a way to reflect light. Its bark became lighter in color, and during the colder season, when its branches also freeze over, the sight is something of a natural winter wonderland. It also developed a partnership with a fungus that connects to its roots and fans out under the forest, gathering up nutrients that trees can't reach. For these services, the tree gives the fungus sugars in return. The birch's companion is dangerous and shouldn't be consumed by people. It's easy to recognize with the classical scarlet-topped red-sprinkled mushroom head. A natural festival not to be missed is Japan's cherry blossom season. The pinkish-white blossom is deeply rooted in Japanese culture, going hand-in-hand with a local saying called mano no arare. Was I even close on that? Which relatively translates to the fact that everything is temporary, regardless of how perfect or beautiful it is. Should you ever visit Japan, you'll quickly see that the cherry blossom symbol is everywhere, from company logos to even clothing or household items. Yosemite National Park in California once had an amazing tree structure that was turned into a tunnel. It was a coast redwood tree, stretching 227 feet tall. It was nicknamed Wawona, the Native American word for the hoot of an owl. The tree fell in 1969 because of a heavy snow, but it survived as an ecosystem for animals, plants, and insects. It's now called the fallen tunnel tree. One tree species known as Fercapas vivervet, well, you read it, is the rarest plant on Earth. The Guinness World Record book recorded one single tree of its kind off the coast of New Zealand. It wasn't always that lonely, but humans brought goats to the island, which nipped at every other member of its family. Ow! Luckily, scientists are looking at ways to plant new specimens. Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. It's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So, take a look at them carefully now, and you might just avoid a disaster. 
Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish, but its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinansia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance. Especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles, so you better pay attention because otherwise the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So, better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. Yeesh! Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish! It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, 
northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific Oceans. But it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. The last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake, and yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain. Check this out. There's a giant tornado heading towards you, and it's so fast. These twisters can move at crazy speeds of more than 250 miles per hour. Plus, they can carve a pathway 50 miles long and a mile wide. Sometimes you can see them coming clearly, while in some cases, low-hanging clouds or rain can hide them, so they sneak up on you and you don't even see them. And in most cases, a tornado can develop so fast that no one can even warn you in time if it's already too close. And now, this insane storm is really close. Maybe you have a couple of minutes to get somewhere safe. Do you have a basement? Go hide! Or maybe, I know this is a crazy idea, but what do you think about going inside a tornado to check what it would be like? Now, some tornadoes appear as rope-like swirls, while others have wide clouds in the shape of a funnel. And here's the second one, right before you. Look at these whirling winds born in a thunderstorm. They extend down from it to the ground. Many times, hail joins the party too. The U.S. itself has something like a thousand tornadoes per year. Texas holds the record with about 120 tornadoes per year, a record not to be proud of. But you'll generally see most twisters in Tornado Alley, which is a stretch of land in the Midwestern part of the U.S. They develop when warm, moist air coming from Mexico meets cool, dry air from Canada. These two clash and turn into a powerful storm that at some point can spawn tornadoes. And you'll see most tornadoes there between April and June, though lately, some have come even in December. They can range from a regular dust storm to an incredibly powerful force that can carry away cars, large trees, and even houses. 
But this is a unique chance. You've never been this close, right? Plus, it's a gigantic one. You don't often get to see such a big one. Okay, ready then? It's getting closer. You feel the wind getting stronger while tossing dirt and debris in your face. You close your eyes and whoosh! You're inside, and it's crazy! Vicious winds are hurling and spinning you around. They're lifting you up at the same time. Feeling dizzy? Feeling like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? Now may be a good time to check what's really happening to you while inside swirling with winds and… Oh wait! Is that your neighbor's motorcycle spinning together with you? Hope it'll stay that far away. Now, let's take a moment to catch up. Being in the middle of a raging tornado is actually something you might survive. But I won't lie to you, it won't be easy. The first thing you'd sense would likely be the temperature changes. Inside this crazy twister, it can be 36 degrees colder than outside of it. That's because the center of the tornado funnel spins all the time. All that funneling makes the inside of the vortex way colder, and it makes the air way thinner than you used to. The air would be 20% less dense than, for example, what you would find at high altitudes. Now, I hope you're not planning to stay there for too long. Disclaimer here, the atmospheric pressure inside this swirling vortex is so low that your lungs won't be able to extract <coughs> enough oxygen. Now, to give you a perspective of all this, breathing inside a tornado is like trying to get some air at an altitude of 26,000 feet. That's a pro level, similar to climbing Everest. So yeah, you'll need some help just to be able to take a regular breath. In short, you'll probably pass out after only a couple of minutes. But don't worry, I brought you this special mask, so breathing is not a problem anymore. Hey, did you notice how smooth the airflow from the inside is? Some storm watchers ended up inside a tornado. Later, they said it all looked so chaotic with all those raging clouds and wind swirling around. But from the inside, the air is surprisingly smooth. But that doesn't mean you'll get a peaceful ride because of it. And it's not a solo party in that thing. The neighbor's motorcycle is not the only thing you'll see there. Wood, bricks, glass, maybe even cars, cows, motorhomes, bricks, roofs, and other big objects. You'd be pretty lucky if nothing crashes into you in all that chaos. With all that debris that's swirling at, for instance, 310 miles per hour, you can hardly avoid it. But let's just say a miracle happens and you got through it. Now you're really dizzy, and you're just wondering when all of this is going to be over and if you're even going to be able to come out of this gigantic tornado. Well, the tornado will eventually slow down. It happens because cool air enters the twister. Just because things are settling down, it doesn't mean you can relax. Well, your stomach can <laughs> since all that crazy swirling is done, but the tornado will drop you from whatever height you're on when it stops. If you're somewhere in the countryside, there might be some soft bale of hay to break your fall. Oh wait, we're talking about a twister that's probably more than 45,000 feet tall, so that won't work. I hope you brought your parachute, because now would be a good time to pop it. Nope. Hey, don't worry. I'm all about happy endings, so I'll help you out. Here you go. And now you're slowing down, enjoying the view, if you even see anything around you from all that dizziness. How come there are clear sunlit skies from your left, you may wonder? It's not unusual. Tornadoes often form near the edge of a thunderstorm. It's like a border between two different worlds. And it wasn't even windy. Plus, the air was very still before it hit, right? Well, that's common too. Okay, I think you know this kind of scenario is impossible in reality. So it would be best to find a safe spot quickly if a tornado was close by. Use your underground shelter first. And if you don't have one, your basement could be the next best choice. Prepare ahead of time with a battery-operated TV or radio, together with fresh batteries, or a device with internet to be able to hear the latest updates on the tornado. Include some non-perishable food, water, and other essentials prepared too. As it turns out, some people really were picked up by tornadoes, and they managed to go through it. A tornado actually dropped them a few hundred feet away without a scratch. Hey, I'd say that's a whole lot of bother just to save some bucks on Uber. But you can't have a guarantee you'll be safe or where you'll end up. It would be incredibly hard to get out of one of those big and fierce ones, though, like supercells. They fall into the category of the strongest type of storms, mostly thunderstorms. 
And imagine falling into water spouts. Those could be fine, though, at least the beginning, because they're weak and they form over warm water. So they could be like a part of your spa day, at least until they move inland and turn into a real tornado. Now, dust devils wouldn't be that pleasant. They're not that big, but we're talking about columns of air that rotate at large speeds. And you can easily see them because of all that dirt and dust they pick up, which is why you need glasses for that. Whoops, wait, I forgot that, so I can't help you this time. But if it makes you feel any better, they're not associated with thunderstorms. Hmm, don't know why that would make anyone feel better when I think about it. But if you're willing to jump into a fire tornado, I'll find you a special suit that will keep you safe while spinning through smoke, gas, and flames. I promise! Columns here are narrow, and they rise vertically into the air, similar to a dust devil. Of course, the heat is crazy. And as updrafts are becoming stronger, and if there's enough dry fuel, a fire whirl is turning into a real fire tornado that extends from the ground up to the cloud, moving incredibly fast. Okay, let's stop now. I'm pretty dizzy. Imagine you're hanging out somewhere in the forests of Australia. You're thirsty, so you go to the nearest stream. Suddenly, you feel that you have a runny nose. It's strange, because you're perfectly healthy. You stop and wait. A few seconds pass. Your nose is itching. A few minutes pass. Your eyes are watering. Your throat is going crazy. You can't breathe freely, and you're constantly sneezing. It seems you're breathing poisoned air. But what's poisoning it? The smallest particles of the most dangerous plant in the world are flying around you. It's called Gimpy Gimpy. There it is. It looks ordinary. A small bush with green stems and leaves. The closer you come, the worse you're feeling. You need more air, and your skin is turning red. It physically hurts you to be here. You may lose consciousness if you stay here for a little bit more. Do you know what will happen if you touch this plant? Well, it will feel like red-hot needles penetrating your skin. And even if you run away as far as possible from here right now, the pain will not subside. The effects of the sting will last for several hours. Days will pass, and the pain will remain. Weeks and months will pass, but you'll still feel it. You can wash the touch area with cold water and soap, but this won't help a lot. It might not go away for several years. And all those tiny plant hairs that penetrated your skin can stay with you forever. The toxicity of Gimpy Gimpy is so high that even if you tear off one leaf and touch it after a year, it will still cause damage to your body. The bad news is that this plant is hard to spot. You can easily confuse it with burdock or nettle. Just imagine what will happen if someone falls into the bush. Its distinctive feature is a thin layer of fluff on each leaf. But be careful. This fluff consists of thousands of poisonous hairs. They also fly around the plant, so it's dangerous to be here without a gas mask. An ordinary medical mask won't help here, since the hairs can get through the fabric. The good news is, there aren't many of them around the world, and people usually put warning signs near them. This bad guy grows in Australia. Gold miners discovered this plant in 1860, near the town of Gympie. And something is telling me it wasn't the happiest discovery. Even now, Gimpy Gimpy poses a serious danger to loggers and tourists. You may accidentally touch it with your hand. One touch is enough to make you lose your working capacity for several weeks. In some cases, the affected area continues to hurt for decades. One man fell into the bush and lost his mind because of the pain. People compare a Gimpy Gimpy sting with a bite of 30 wasps at the same time. And you won't know how to get rid of it. One guy experienced an unpleasant feeling every time he took a shower for two years after touching this plant. If you want to study it, you need to wear a protective suit and a gas mask. There should be no open areas on your body. Tuck your pant legs into your boots, put on protective gloves, and move out into the forest. It grows on the edge, next to streams. Gimpy Gimpy is one of the six species of poisonous trees native to Australia. They love the sun and the vegetation around them. Every hair on the surface of the leaf is poisoned. When it contacts any surface, it opens and sprays a burning toxin. Then the pain increases and the skin turns red. 
The duration of the effect depends on the number of hairs that penetrate your body. After a few years, you can put pressure on the bite site and feel the hairs are still there. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what the toxic poison's components are. All they know is that the poison effect lasts a very long time, several years. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Water only enhances its effect. Botanical samples of this plant in laboratories are still dangerous, despite scientists keeping them for several years. After you have passed by Gimpy Gimpy, don't forget to disinfect yourself. Carefully remove clothes, shoes, masks, and glasses. Put a protective suit in the washing machine and wash everything else well. Tiny hairs can be in your pants or the sleeves of your jacket, so be careful. This toxicity makes Gimpy Gimpy the most protected plant in the world. But wait, what's that? Do you see these little holes on its leaves? It seems that someone is eating it. These are the usual nocturnal beetle species. They can devour Gimpy Gimpy all day long, as the poisonous hairs can't harm them. These bugs just don't care. Gimpy Gimpy is the perfect lunch, as no one can disturb these beetles while they're sitting on this plant. And yes, all the animals living nearby know that it's better not to get close to it. But there's one mammal that is not afraid of Gimpy Gimpy. It's a red-legged patamelon. It looks like a little kangaroo and loves to eat the Gimpy Gimpy leaves. Scientists still don't know what exactly protects this animal from toxic hairs. We know almost all the places where this plant grows. People mark them with signs. If you see one, just don't go there. Gimpy Gimpy is a terrible plant, but how about a plant that can take over the whole world and destroy all the crops? It doesn't need favorable conditions for growth. It can survive in the rain, in arid places under the scorching sun, at low and high temperatures. It's called the giant hogweed. If the seed of this plant gets into a vegetable bed or a wheat field, the plant will displace all competitors in a few weeks. The wind can blow on the giant hogweed seeds and spread them further to the nearest territories. This plant can worsen ecosystems around the world. It grows faster than people manage to destroy it. If you spray poison on the leaves, it doesn't even care. If you let parasitic beetles into giant hogweed territory, it doesn't care either. It multiplies very fast and lives longer than many plants. The giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story huh? house and go deep underground with its roots. It's also dangerous to touch it with your hands. It can turn your skin red, and it won't feel good to say the least. That's how it's making it so hard to fight against it. This poison destroys any plants, bushes, and flowers nearby. Scientists still can't create an effective poison to combat this green monster. No beetles feed on it. That's why the giant hogweed is one of the most dangerous plants in the world. It simply has no enemies in nature. But scientists are sure that evolution will create some creatures capable of destroying the giant hogweed. It can be small bugs or parasitic bacteria. But until that happens, people have to fight this beast on their own. They spend millions of dollars trying to destroy the plant, but it doesn't always work out. You can burn a field, but if one seed remains, it will quickly grow on the scorched ground. You've seen some of the most dangerous plants in the world. But what about trees? A manchineel tree grows in Florida. Its trunk secretes toxic juice that's dangerous for your skin, but it gets much worse during the rain. When water falls on the bark, it mixes with the poison. Then, these poison drops can bounce off the tree and get on your skin. Leaves and fruits also have this toxin, so never hide under this tree in bad weather. Mushrooms, shrubs, and flowers don't grow near this tree either. Animals never come close to it. Birds never sit on its branches. Manchineel trees are resistant to water and high temperatures. Never try to burn it. The smoke released during combustion is toxic and dangerous to your eyes. The locals mark this tree with red circles. Who do you think will win? A hungry grizzly or a ripe berry? An angry tiger or a beautiful flower? A huge python or a green bush? The answer's not so obvious. Now you'll see who really controls the jungle and forests. Meet the most dangerous plants on Earth. This is the water hemlock. It grows in North America in swampy areas of fields and meadows. 
Also, you can find this plant on the shores of rivers and streams. It seems harmless, but it's one of the most poisonous plants in the U.S. Water hemlock toxins can cause critical damage to an adult in 15 minutes, but only if you swallow it. Many people mistakenly confuse it with artichoke, celery, and anise. Despite the dangerous poison, water hemlock is used to cure migraines and intestinal diseases. This plant has caused a lot of damage to livestock. White snake root grows in fields and pastures. When a cow bites it, the plant releases a fat-soluble toxin. This poison gets not only inside the animal, but also into the milk. Young calves who drink the milk also become infected. Poisoned milk is also dangerous for people. The problem is that this plant, native to North America, is one of the longest-lived autumn flowers. Now in modern farms, the poison of this plant is not so dangerous. But on small private pastures, white snake root is the number one danger. We all know two kinds of beans, the ones we eat and the ones that Jack used to get to the realm of giants. In addition to them, there are poisonous ones. These are called castor beans. They contain one of the most dangerous toxins in the world, ricin. As soon as it enters your body, it blocks the production of proteins necessary for life. Without these proteins, your cells stop functioning. The more cells are destroyed, the more your body suffers. The castor bean releases ricin when squeezed. Several beans can cause dehydration, weakness, hallucinations, seizures, and other problems. About seven beans are enough to cause critical damage. So remember what they look like and never touch them if you see them in the woods. One of the most beautiful plants on the planet is also one of the most dangerous. This is oleander. Everything is poisonous in it. The stem, the root, and the pink flower. Even a tiny piece of this plant can lead to severe poisoning. It doesn't need to get inside your stomach to create severe problems. Just a little touch to the juice of the flower causes allergies. And don't try to burn it, as the smoke of a burning oleander has toxic effects too. And now, the most dangerous plant in the world. One touch of it will hurt you for several years. Or you may feel the consequences all your life. The Gimpy Gimpy plant, also called the Queensland Stinger, looks like an ordinary burdock bush. It doesn't look like anything poisonous at all. But if you stand next to this plant, you'll feel suffocation and watery eyes. There are thousands of tiny poisonous hairs on the leaves of this flower. They're so light, they can hang in the air and spread by the wind. So you should put on a gas mask if you want to look at the plant. But if you lightly touch Gimpy Gimpy, you're in big trouble. Some compare one Gimpy Gimpy sting to 30 wasp stings at the same time. Poisonous hairs easily penetrate under your skin and cause irritation and pain. The problem is that you can't pull them out. Wash with soap and water, use some disinfecting ointment, and you'll see that the situation is only worsening. The hairs can't be pulled out of there. They sit there, releasing toxins and driving you crazy. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what components the toxin consists of. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Unpleasant sensations can last for several hours, days, or even months. People who touched the plant said that the pain from the sting returned even after a few years. But if it's impossible to get rid of the hairs, then the only way out is to wait for them to lose their toxicity. But there's another problem here. You can tear off one Gimpy Gimpy leaf with gloves and put it in the laboratory, dry it, and forget about it for a few years. And here it lies in front of you, a withered, almost destroyed leaf. It seems harmless, but it's not. Even after many years, the poisonous hairs remain on the leaf surface and still cause toxin effects. Gimpy Gimpy only grows in Australia. It loves the sun and dense green forests. It used to pose a severe danger to tourists and loggers. But now, all places with this plant are marked with a warning sign. At botanical exhibitions, scientists put this plant in a cage so people wouldn't touch it. Rosary peas can be white seeds with a black eye or black seeds with a white eye. 
You can find these plants in Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Ocean region. Some species were transported to Florida and Hawaii by people. You could encounter this plant even on city streets. Rosary pea seeds are used in jewelry and some toys. People who wear rosary pea bracelets probably don't know about its seeds' toxicity. Rosary peas, as well as the castor bean, contribute to the destruction of cells. Interestingly, rosary pea seeds are used not only as decorations, but also for healing certain health conditions. This is the only poisonous plant from the list that looks poisonous. You probably won't want to pick it up when you notice it. See this red stem that looks more like an artery or an enlarged nervous system? And those berries are similar to eyes. Doll's eye looks a little creepy. Their internal structure is also as unpleasant as their appearance. Doll's eye has a dangerous toxin. The longer they grow, the more poisonous their composition gets. Doll's eye chemicals have a sedative effect on muscles and hearts. This means that your body relaxes so much that it stops working. You've probably seen this plant in reality or wildlife movies. Venus flytraps are rare representatives of carnivorous plants. Fortunately, they're not as dangerous for humans as for insects. But in any case, you shouldn't stick your finger in them. So here's how they work. The plant opens its mouth. There's a red petal with a fragrant smell in its middle. It's a decoy. A fly or some beetle notices this and decides to try it. They climb inside the flower. But the Venus flytrap doesn't immediately get closed. Tiny sensitive hairs inside the plant count the movements of the fly. If the fly has made more than two movements within 20 seconds, the plant closes its mouth in less than a second. This interval prevents the Venus flytrap from needlessly slamming when some garbage lands there. Then the fly becomes trapped. The bristles on the plant's jaws work like a cage. Prey cannot escape. Then the Venus flytrap injects digestive juice into its mouth, which destroys the fly. Five to 12 days later, the plant opens again and waits for a new lunch. The Venus flytrap can eat flies, beetles, spiders, and even little frogs. Giant hogweed causes the most extensive damage among all plants. It's dangerous not specifically for one person, but for entire forests and fields. Giant hogweed is an invasive plant. It's like a parasite. It multiplies quickly and destroys all other flowers in the area. Insects don't feed on giant hogweed. It's also problematic for people to destroy it, since giant hogweed causes an allergic reaction on the skin. It grows quickly, it's immune to poisons, and lives long. Giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story house and be deeply rooted in the ground. It releases its seeds, and a light breeze spreads them for miles. Scientists still can't create an effective way to combat it. There's nothing that can defeat giant hogweed in nature. Well, not yet. Nature and evolution always find a balance. Texas is home to some of the oddest, creepiest, and most unusual animals you've ever heard of. It might come as a surprise, but this state is full of creatures you'll hardly see in other places. So, let's have a look at the most amazing ones. This truly beautiful, bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny. Usually no bigger than a grape, you may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. One tourist spotted a few of these pretty dragons on the shore of Mustang Island. He scooped one of the creatures up. He wanted to film it. Luckily, he put it back into the water before it could sting him. Otherwise, it would have ended badly since the blue sea dragon is venomous. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch. All because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese man-o'-war, a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells. 
And then, they steal these cells from the manowar's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then, they release these stinging cells on contact, which makes their own sting more powerful, even worse than that of the manowar itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're great to camouflage these animals on the seafloor. Now how about a funny fact? A group of tiny dragons floating together is called a blue fleet. And another fact. Blue dragons normally lay a string of around 16 eggs. And it takes them three days or so to hatch into larvae. Blue sea dragons rarely make it to the shore. They're soft-bodied, so when the animals finally get through the surf zone and are deposited on the shore, they're already broken apart. And still, watch out! Even in this case, the venom in their bodies doesn't dissipate. But of course, blue sea dragons aren't the only unusual animals inhabiting Texas. Have a look at this nightmarish creature. Poisonous, slimy, and kinda immortal. Meet the hammerhead worm. The worst thing? It might be lurking in your garden while you're watching this video. You can easily recognize this worm by its creepy spade-shaped head. It doesn't look like any other invertebrate you've ever seen. Or any other creature, that is. At first, it was only found in East Texas. But later, researchers spotted these spine-chilling creatures in North, Central, and South Texas. Basically everywhere but the arid areas of West Texas. One of the most terrifying things about this worm might be its length. This creature can grow as long as one foot. Luckily, such giants aren't very common. Most hammerhead worms only reach 6 inches in length. You can come across two species of these worms in Texas, and both of them will have a dark stripe down the middle. The larger of these two species munches on earthworms, which is actually a big problem. You might know that earthworms play an important role in keeping the soil rich in minerals and overall healthy. If earthworms disappear, plants in such areas won't be getting the nutrients they need. Even for humans and pets, meeting a hammerhead worm isn't the most pleasant experience either. Hammerheads are the only terrestrial invertebrates that secrete a very dangerous neurotoxin, the same as pufferfish produce. Thanks to the sheer size of the human body, touching a hammerhead worm won't hurt you too much, but it may still cause your hand to start tingling or even go numb. It's much more dangerous for pets. There have been cases when dogs ate hammerheads, which left them feeling sick for the whole day. Interestingly, these worms are native to Southeast Asia. But they must have mastered the art of hitchhiking, since in the early 1900s, they were already found in the U.S. Keep in mind that if you want to get rid of a hammerhead worm, which is the best course of action, the worst thing you can do is chop it with a shovel. The thing is, Flatworms reproduce by ripping themselves in half, so by cutting it, you actually help the populations of the worms, turning one into two. That's the reason why hammerheads are sometimes described as immortal, which is a bit of a stretch since these creatures can't survive in vinegar or salt. Now even though you're safe from the hammerhead worm in West Texas, it doesn't mean you can't come across another dangerous animal, such as the land lobster from hell. These creatures are also known as vinegaroons, and they're not real crustaceans, they're arachnids! Huh? Who would have guessed? Anyway, these eight-legged critters have a really nasty bite, but it's not the worst thing about them. Land lobsters, brace yourself, spray vinegar-like 85% acid from their tails. Mostly they do it to protect themselves, but it still sounds like an unfriendly thing to do, right? A land lobster can also pinch a finger that's gotten too close with its heavy mouth parts. At the base of their abdomens, vinegaroons have long whip-like tails. That's why these arachnids are often called whip scorpions, even though they're neither related to scorpions nor have stingers. 
Summer rains lure these arachnids out of their burrows in search of food and love. Luckily, experts claim that land lobsters aren't poisonous to humans, but they're very likely to leave a mark with their large pinchers, which they use to capture insects. Vinegaroons can be considered useful since they eat millipedes, crickets, scorpions, and cockroaches. They hunt by sensing the vibrations of their prey with those long front legs of theirs. Since land lobsters prefer to come out after dark, you aren't likely to see one in the daylight. But if you stumble upon one, check it out. If it's a female, it may be carrying her hatchlings on her back. Now, imagine it's the middle of spring and you're walking among blooming flowers and greenery. Suddenly, you spot something extremely bizarre on the ground. The animal looks cute, fluffy, and soft-looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out! The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. This one is called the pus moth caterpillar, or asp. There are several stinging caterpillar species in Texas. The buck moth caterpillar, spiny oak slug caterpillar, saddleback caterpillar, and eel moth caterpillar. And touching any of them can lead to unpleasant consequences. If you had touched that pretty hairy thing in the park, you'd most likely start feeling a burning sensation and develop an itchy rash. In the worst case scenario, you'd even have to go to the emergency room. The main problem is that people react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensation and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. On the bright side, such caterpillars later turn into moths and butterflies that help pollinate flowers and trees. Getting rid of these critters means doing a massive disservice to the area where you live. Specialists are sure that coming across a stinging caterpillar won't lead to anything bad if you keep in mind the rule of thumb. If a caterpillar looks fuzzy, don't touch it. And the best solution to dealing with such creatures is educating people on what such caterpillars are, what they look like, and why it's dangerous to touch them with unprotected hands. Look at this pretty creature. It looks cute and totally harmless. But you should know that appearances are deceptive, and the blue-ringed octopus is an extremely venomous species of octopus. In fact, they are one of the world's most venomous marine animals. These creatures are found in tide pools and coral reefs. Despite their small size, a mere 5 to 8 inches, they are very dangerous to humans if provoked. Their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin. When the animal feels threatened, its first instinct is to flee. But if the threat persists, for example, if you don't give up the idea of picking the octopus up, it will go into a defensive stance and display its blue rings. If the octopus is cornered and touched, it may bite its attacker, and it can end very, very badly. Tetrodotoxin causes severe consequences and sometimes results in total body paralysis. When the victim is fully aware of the surroundings but unable to move, the victim remains conscious and alert, but because of the paralysis, there's no way of signaling for help or indicating distress. Interestingly, in its chilling mode, the blue-ringed octopus looks brown or even pale, but once it feels endangered, it switches on its psychedelic pattern. Such a response is called aposematic behavior. In simple words, it's when an animal flashes bright colors warning others that, should they take a bite, they won't live to tell the tale. Of course, the blue-ringed octopus isn't the only dangerous animal that looks harmless out there. For example, look at this creature. This animal looks super cute, fluffy and soft looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out. The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. It's called the puss moth caterpillar or asp. Hidden among that luxurious fur, there are venom spines equipped with stinging cells like jellyfish. People react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensations and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. The next animal on our list is the poison dart frog. There are more than 170 species of these frogs, and funnily enough, not all of them are actually poisonous. Those which are secret, extremely dangerous toxins through their skin. 
On the bright side, the frogs never use these toxins for hunting or attacking. They only have them for self-defense. Experts aren't sure, but they suppose that the frog's ability to produce these toxins might come from a diet rich in toxin-containing animals, for example, centipedes or ants. Indigenous peoples in Central and South America have been known to rub their arrows and darts on the frogs in order to give them a poison tip. The main thing you need to keep in mind, if you touch a poison dart frog, seek assistance immediately. Especially if you've come across the golden poison dart frog, it's the most toxic one. The flamboyant cuttlefish is the only known venomous cuttlefish species. This creature has incredibly poisonous muscle tissue, despite its tiny, two to three inches at most frame. Watch out for a dark brown underwater animal with two tentacles and eight arms. It's also likely to have purple and yellow around its arms. Anyway, your best bet is to avoid biting into one of these intriguing creatures, and you'll most likely be safe. Predatory cone snails are very slow animals. This is the main reason why they have no means to capture their prey mechanically. I mean, they can't really grasp another animal or bite it. Instead, the cone snail has evolved potent venom that helps it survive. Probably the coolest thing about these creatures is that among almost 1,000 species, there's no overlap in the toxins produced by each of them. Even though cone snails don't have fangs, they have a venom-covered harpoon they use to sting their prey. There's a tube-like structure at the end of a venom bulb, and a modified tooth can shoot out of the tube at a mind-boggling speed of 400 miles per hour. So being slow pokes doesn't actually bother cone snails. And since the venom is unique to certain species, some of them can deliver a minor sting, while others might cause serious harm to your health. For example, this reef-dwelling little fella unleashes a harpoon-like tooth to sting its prey, and there is no known cure for its venom. When you think of puffer fish, you probably imagine a bloated-looking creature with impressive 360-degree quills. But beneath those funny spikes, there is a vicious creature. And the most dangerous part of this creature is its poison, which is considered to be one of, if not the, most dangerous and potent in the world. The good news is that you won't get poisoned unless you eat the fish. So maybe better stick to the California roll. Now look at this insect and try to never approach it. It's the Japanese giant hornet. This monstrously sized creature, which can grow to be almost two inches long, is known to be highly aggressive. Its impressive stinger packs enough venom to make the sting very, and I mean it, painful. Some people don't survive being stung by this insect. Even though the venom isn't the most potent, the large size of the creature makes the dose too big. And if it's not one but several hornets attacking you, well, the consequences are likely to be dramatic. The giant hornet isn't necessarily unfriendly toward people or other animals, but it will sting if you provoke it. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny, usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch, all because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese Man of War, a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells, and then they steal these cells from the Man of War's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact, which makes their own sting even more powerful, even worse than that of the Man of War's itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see, that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the sea surface. The Arukanji jellyfish, found in Australia, looks tiny and totally innocent. But appearances are deceitful and this baby the size of a human thumbnail is actually extremely dangerous. During stinger season, which lasts from November to May, tons of beaches get closed because of these itsy bitsy creatures. What makes the jellyfish particularly dangerous is their miniature size. People simply fail to notice them while swimming. The infamous box jellyfish, named for its cubic body shape, lives in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Stay away if you spot a creature with a squarish bell and long, dangling tentacles. And even if you only see a single tentacle without the jellyfish attached to it, 
Don't come close or touch it. The box jellyfish can grow up to 10 feet, and each of its tentacles has about 500,000 microscopic harpoons to inject venom. Unlike other jellyfish, box jellyfish are hunters. They can latch onto you by wrapping their slender tentacles around your limb or body. With how dangerous their venom is, it won't be a pleasant experience. You're relaxing at the beach when suddenly you notice a huge flock of birds. They're excited about something near the water. You get the urge to go and investigate what's going on there. Here's some advice. Sit back down and stay away from the water. I get it, you think you're tough enough to handle a few pecks from a seagull. But it's not the birds that have me worried, it's what's lurking beneath the water. Fish are a staple of many diets across the animal kingdom, both above and below the ocean. Tuna, squid and octopus, as well as marine mammals like seals, all prey on a wide variety of smaller fish. Species such as bluefish and striped bass are their favorite dinnertime meal. They're also the favorite of another ultra predator, which is why you shouldn't join those birds by the water. If you do, you're risking an encounter with a creature that can measure up to 20 feet long. That's three times the size of an average human. These are the size credentials of a great white shark. If there are fish around, they may come up near the ocean surface to feed. A great white shark has the strongest bite force among animals. The only other animal species that comes close to them is the saltwater crocodile. And boy is their ability to catch whiffs strong. Scientists believe it to be more than 100 times stronger than a human's. They don't even use the nostrils located beneath their snouts to breathe. It simply serves as a specialized sniffer. Thankfully though, we're not the favorite meal of a shark, and the creature isn't going out of its way to hunt us. Researchers claim that the odds of being attacked by a shark are as low as 1 in 3.7 million. When unfortunate meetings between sharks and humans do happen, a shark may mistake a human for a seal or an extremely large striped bass. This is why you should stay away from those birds and fishes and just let the other animals animal. You just focus on catching a tan in that sun chair. So I guess this means that sharks have poor vision? Not quite. Their vision in clear water is up to 10 times better than that of humans swimming in the same environment. The structure of a shark's eye is quite similar to that of our own. It consists of a cornea, lens, retina, deep blue iris, and the pupil. Their eyes have two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones, just like humans. Although we're not too sure how well rods and cones perform for sharks, research has shown that they possess only one type of cone. It means they most likely don't have full color vision like a human. This might explain why they can sometimes mix humans up with other creatures. But hey, who's ever really fully focused when they're about to devour their dinner? Shark eyes also have tapitum lucidum. This is a layer of mirrored crystals located behind the shark's retina. These crystals allow the shark to see quite well in extremely dim light and murky water. The crystals reflect incoming light, which gives the rods inside the retina a second chance at detecting light that they might have missed the first time around. Fun fact, cats also have tapitum lucidum. This is why your cat's eyes glow in the dark when you shine a light on them. Another telltale sign that sharks may be hovering around in nearby waters is the presence of whales. Sharks have been known to stalk the creatures for over 100 miles. They'll follow pods waiting for one of the members to become vulnerable before expertly striking. So, lesson learned? If you now see birds by the water, it's probably not a good thing, unlike when you see thousands of birds flying together through the sky. This is known as murmuration. You can see thousands of starlings unite together in the sky, moving in unison, dipping and swerving at the same time. It's like they're competing in some sort of synchronization event at the Bird Olympics. This happens when the birds begin to roost. It can be as early as September in some places and as late as the end of November elsewhere, with more birds joining the nightly displays during this time. Are they doing it for our entertainment? Well, not really. Grouping together in the sky offers protection from predators, like falcons. 
It can also get cold when you're flying that high up. So, the birds gather in their thousands to keep warm and exchange information on potential feeding sites. Okay, so in this case, a huge group of birds doesn't mean anything evil. But if you ever see some flying towards you whilst in a wooded area, it's probably time to leave the area. Birds and other animals flee wildfire areas. Certain mammals, like amphibians, may actually stay in the fire. Instead of fleeing for their lives, they will dig underground to escape it. But nearly all other animals will try their best to leave. Oh, and don't forget to jump out of the way whilst all those animals are running towards you. Why don't we switch back from birds to sharks? Yes, we now know if there are birds near the ocean surface, then sharks will probably be quite close as well. But what if there are no sharks anywhere near at all? If you ever happen to be in the ocean and notice some sharks heading deep towards the bottom of the ocean, this may be a sign that a hurricane or a tropical storm is on the way. Sharks can sense the drop in barometric pressure that accompanies the storm, so they could be trying to get out of the hectic zone. Sharks don't quite care for humans, so they don't view our sandy beaches and inland towns and cities as safety zones. They're quite intelligent creatures and know the deeper they go in the ocean, the safer it gets. But the ocean's not always the best place to go in an emergency. Case in point, if you come across sea creatures who usually live in water randomly resting on the sand, don't get inside the water. This is a sign that the water is potentially toxic. It's possible that a red tide is congregating in the water near the beach. Red tides happen all over the world but one algae species causes them in the Gulf of Mexico. A red tide occurs when the water is full of more toxic algae than normal. It can make the water reddish or brown, but sometimes the water's color is normal. If you go in the water, you might experience respiratory irritation like coughing or an itchy throat. If this happens to you, you should thoroughly rinse your mouth with fresh water. Speaking of water, Frogs are famous for their croaking, but if you've ever heard them do it a lot more than usual, it might be because it's about to rain. One theory says that this might have to do with their mating. They first do it, then lay eggs in bodies of fresh water. A good rain means more watery real estate for the frogs. That's why male frogs invite the ladies for a date before the showers with a croaking symphony. If you hear a lot of buzzing around, meaning the bees are more active than usual, a storm could be on the way. When they feel like it's approaching, bees start working even harder and faster to collect more nectar before the storm. And once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before the heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it. Their secret is super sensitive hairs on their back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. <laughs>something interesting has recently happened in south dakota it was all over the internet so perhaps you already know about it in july of 2022 the sky in this state suddenly turned green so what happened there was it caused by a human or by nature let's find out tuesday july 5th 2022 shortly after a heavy storm the sky over South Dakota in the U.S. was still overcast. Locals finally went outside and saw that the sky had an intense dark green hue, and they'd never seen anything like that before. People said that it looked like something straight up from science fiction or even a horror movie. Unsurprisingly, South Dakotans immediately started spreading the news all over social media. People shared their beautiful yet very eerie pictures on Twitter. They showed the sky over the city of Sioux Falls and a few other towns. Even though it may look like something supernatural, in reality, this is not a terrifying phenomenon at all. It's a simple play of the light and the atmosphere. Something like this happens quite rarely and usually means that really bad weather is approaching. And that's also true to what happened in South Dakota. Just before people started sharing photos, a thunderstorm swept through the town of Sioux Falls. This was confirmed by the U.S. Weather Service. This hurricane was terrible. The wind speed was about 100 miles per hour. 
According to the Buford scale on wind speeds, this is the fastest and most destructive storm. There are only 12 numbers on this scale, and the maximum wind strength starts at 73 miles per hour. But why isn't this all over the news then? Well, because it's kind of a usual thing for the residents. Thunderstorms occur very often in the United States, especially in the warmer months. And one out of 10 such thunderstorms can become something serious, like a tornado. This one wasn't an exception. It was the so-called Derreco storm. Derreco is very widespread and long-lived. It's actually a combination of a fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms and downpours. People often say that a Derreco is as strong as a tornado. Still, there's a difference between them. A tornado is a vortex, a rotating column of air. It's usually about 500 feet in diameter, although sometimes its width can reach up to 2.5 miles. I don't envy those who would stumble upon that. But the main point is that they rotate. The wind moves very fast in a circle, near some invisible center. A derecho is a strong thunderstorm, or a system of strong thunderstorms with straight line winds. In other words, it doesn't spin. Instead, the derecho chooses a point somewhere and simply runs to it, like a very motivated marathon runner. If we compare a derecho to an ordinary tornado, the latter has six levels of strength, from 40 to 380 miles per hour. So a derecho is kind of like a small, average level one to two tornado. Usually, its speed is within the range of 73 to 113 miles per hour. And in both cases, they can be accompanied by severe thunderstorms, lightning, and rain. But still, these are different things. A storm becomes a derecho if the damage trail left by it exceeds 240 miles, and if the wind speed is at least 58 miles per hour. It's quite difficult to predict. It can form even on a clear day, when meteorologists don't even anticipate any storms. And then, the winds appear suddenly. It's so surprising that they may even feel explosive. But the National Weather Service tries to warn people at least half an hour or an hour before this happens, so that residents have time to prepare and hide. It wasn't any different this time. The storm swept through almost all of South Dakota, as well as the states of Minnesota and Iowa. The consequences were quite serious. More than 30,000 people were left without electricity. Fortunately, people were fine. That's because the locals are pretty used to derecos. However, the green sky is something different. It became a very unusual sight for the locals. Everyone was wondering why it happened. Was it a bad sign or a normal weather phenomenon? Well, to be honest, scientists don't have an exact explanation. But although there are only assumptions, they sound pretty convincing. A green sky is a very rare phenomenon. Most scientists think that this happens when a powerful storm approaches the area before sunset or sunrise. Then the sky will turn green in this area. NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns, who once faced a similar event himself, suggests that the green sky appeared because of the huge hail before the storm. First, let's talk about why the sky looks blue or any other shade, depending on its mood. In short, the sun simultaneously carries all the rays of the color spectrum. It may seem white to us in total, but it actually has all the colors at the same time. However, these color waves all have different lengths. For example, blue rays are shorter than the other ones. They jump away from the air molecules better than the red waves, so they reach us faster. Because of this, on a regular clear day, the sky seems blue. At the same time, red and orange color waves are very long and move slower, so they're usually left behind. But when the sun goes below the horizon or rises, the rays' directions change, and these waves reach us better. It all means that even if the sunrises and sunsets seem red and orange to us, 
In fact, there are still blue and green waves among them. But they have to bounce off something to reach us faster and become stronger than the red rays. Have you guessed what I'm getting at? This is where the water comes into play. Clouds are made up of water droplets. When they become large enough, but don't fall yet, for example, due to strong winds, they affect how the light behaves in the sky. Large, heavy storms mostly consist of water and hail. And water reflects blue and green rays best of all. That's exactly the reason why the water in rivers and lakes seems bluish green to us. Although in reality, it's transparent. And yeah, algae matter too. So, there are a couple of key factors why the sky may turn green. First off, the sun should be at the horizon level. Another factor is that while the storm clouds are approaching, they shouldn't cover the sky completely. There still must be a little room for the sun rays. Then, barely noticeable blue rays jump up to storm clouds. They're repelled by water droplets and hail. Mixing with the red sunset, they turn into a bright green light. And this green light is spreading all over the sky. That's why in most of these cases, when the sky turns green, people can only see it in the evenings. Yeah, it can also happen in the middle of the day. But since the conditions are already quite specific, seeing something like that during the day is even rarer. Still, if you see a green sky, you don't need to panic. It doesn't necessarily mean that a terrible storm is approaching. The chances are high though, but still, it's not a rule. It can be just heavy rain or a heavy hail. In other words, if you see a green sky, then you'd better hide and hide your car. However, if you were lucky enough to see the stunning sky from the comfort of your own home, it's indeed very exciting. If you get a glimpse of something like that, just know that you had a chance to experience something very rare and special. Some people said it was the most incredible thing they had ever seen. Ah, beautiful. You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today. Like it has some kind of ring around it. A rainbow type thing. Huh. Look at that. Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly at the... Stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now. Unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage, so it's not worth it. Grab some sunglasses and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts around 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. In June 2020, what the people were looking at was an anvil cloud, a rare storm formation in the sky. Formed when strong air currents carry water vapor upwards, the air expands and spreads out as it hits the bottom of the stratosphere. It pushes the dense cloud into the cool anvil shape you see. And sometimes it even gets to be a mushroom. Anvil clouds produce some of the most dangerous lightning of all storms. One that's called a bolt out of the blue. This lightning strike seems to magically come out of the blue sky, with the storm being many miles away. This type of bolt comes from the top of the anvil and can be 10 times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. People got so frightened after witnessing a giant cloud that they thought something terrible must have happened. The locals had pictures of the large billow on social media before officials could explain what was going on. Authorities managed to calm everyone's fears by informing them it was nothing more than a natural phenomenon and a beautiful one at that. Before dissipating, these clouds typically stay in one area, regardless of how strong the wind is. If you look off the western coast of France, you'll see the Isle of Ré. Thanks to its beautiful blue waters, clean sandy beaches, and stunning lighthouses, 
This place is a very popular vacation spot. But perhaps the coolest part about the island of Rey is what you see just beyond the shore. Square waves. This strange wave pattern looks like a giant chessboard over the ocean. Many visitors to the island become captivated by these waves and go to high up places like nearby lighthouses to take pictures of this natural phenomenon. They say that when looking down at these square patterns in the water, it's almost as if there's some sort of metal grid underneath it. And while these wave patterns are truly fascinating, the people who choose to enjoy them from afar are doing it right. They know to stay out of the water. To understand how these square waves come to be, it's important to know how waves occur in the first place. Generally, waves can travel many miles over the surface of the water, depending on local winds and weather. And even on days when the weather seems somewhat calm, storms located elsewhere can send in crashing waves that affect the surrounding calm waters. When waves travel onto the shores of distant lands, they're called swells. This is different from a wave that occurs from local wind. When two different swells coming from opposite directions meet, it's known as a cross sea. This is what generates these square waves you see near the Isle of Ray. While these waves are one of the reasons why people flock to this island, they can still expect to enjoy calm, relaxing waters most of the time. The cross sea only occurs during certain times of the year in specific weather. Plus, it's common knowledge around Ray to steer clear of the ocean when these square waves appear. So it's not often that you hear about anyone getting caught in them because most people know better. And since a lot of people on the island are tourists, there are plenty of signs around warning them to get out of the water during this time. However, not everyone gets the memo. There have been a handful of cases where people got caught in the cross sea, but thankfully and luckily, they managed to get out safely. These square waves have become somewhat famous over time, given that there's really no other place in the world that boasts a cross sea like this one. In fact, no one has ever spotted square waves anywhere but the island of Ray. However, there are swells that can be found throughout the oceans in the world, and a cross sea can take place. But if the angle they approach each other at is more shallow, the wave may actually look like it's coming from the same direction, even when it's not. Not to mention, swells can slowly lose momentum as they drift further and further away. So their crest, or the top of the wave, appears more round and less jagged. The Island of Ray's specific wind and weather patterns are literally the perfect storm and create a cross sea that people can clearly recognize. It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously, but after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Oh, creepy. The Christmas Island Crab is part of an amazing phenomenon once a year. Their migration period is determined by the phase of the moon and the first rainfall between October and February, although the precise date can't be predicted. Once the crabs have been prompted, they leave their homes amongst the forest and migrate in massive hordes towards the sea. Numbering in millions, a sea of red crabs is observed as they make their journey across the island creating roadblocks and making their way to the ocean. There, they lay their eggs and then make their trek back, returning to the forest until the next year. There are bridges in the Indian state of Meghlahaya that are created entirely of living tree roots. The bridges are made up of tangled thick roots that are strong enough to hold over 50 people at a time. 
The Kasi and Jaintia tribes became masters in the art of growing these insane bridges. They need them to cross the streams below with ease. Some of these root bridges are over 180 years old. To make them, the members of the tribes care for the roots until they grow long enough to reach the opposite bank. It can take as long as 10 to 15 years to grow a bridge. In the process, the roots become tightly entwined with one another. This is how the bridges get so strong. And once a bridge is fully grown, it can last for over 500 years. While some roots decay, new ones are continually growing. That's why the unusual natural constructions last so long. Light pillars are colorful beams of light that either jet up from Earth towards the sky or shine down from the clouds. Usually, they only occur in cold temperatures as they form when the sunlight gets reflected off ice crystals floating in the air. The higher the crystals are in the air, the taller these bright and colorful pillars become. They're most common at sunrise and sunset. There are hidden caves all over the world that are filled with glowing light. This light comes from hundreds of glow worms that have made a cozy home in the caves. Some of the caves are more than 30 million years old, and most of them can be found in New Zealand and Australia. The worms themselves don't actually glow, but baby worms, called larvae, form silk strings made out of mucus. These strings form nets. It's these nets that can illuminate the entire cave. Their purpose is to attract flies and other tasty insects for the glowworms to munch on. Rainbow trees are 100% a real thing. Hailing from the Philippines and Indonesia, these colorful wonders are called rainbow eucalyptus, or rainbow gum. The rainbow hues are created by the contrast in colors of old and new bark. As the thin surface layers of bark peel away, they reveal newer ones with brighter, more eye-catching colors. The brand new bark is green. Then it changes to purple, then red, and finally brown. This is because the trees contain a substance called chlorophyll. It makes the bark green. As each strip of bark ages, it loses chlorophyll and slowly changes its color. Ah, the beauty of nature all around you. The fresh air and days and days of meditative rest far away from civilization ahead of you. But you've been walking for quite some time to get this far, and now it's time to set up camp. The woods around are dense, and there's no suitable place to put up your tent. Then you notice a nice green patch completely devoid of trees and only sprinkled with some low-growing bushes. Well, you go there, smug about your find, and get to work on the tent. The ground is unusually soft and smooth, but that doesn't bother you too much. All the better! The pegs go into the soil like a knife into butter. By the time you're done, it's dark already, so you get inside the tent and crawl into your cozy sleeping bag. You wake up from a creepy feeling that something's not right. You feel… wet? You start wriggling inside your bag and, yes, it's almost completely soaked from below. You rush out of the tent as quickly as you can and see that it started to sink into the ground. Turns out you've set up camp on a swamp. And you've been lucky too. Swamps aren't always obvious. Sometimes you won't even see them until you're knee-deep in muck and trouble. Getting out of there can be tricky as well. The moss and roots create a soft padding that's slowly pulling you under. And when you try to raise your feet, you might end up without your boots. Telling a forest swamp is fairly easy when you know what to look for. If you're in a dense thicket and see a lush, sunlit glade where nothing but moss and an occasional bush grows, chances are high it's a swamp. You can also check it by stepping lightly on this serene ground. If it feels springy, better stay away. One other thing the swamp can be dangerous for is, surprisingly, a forest fire. If you stay too close to a swamp and start a campfire, it might catch on, especially if there's a strong wind. Swamps and marshes are chock full of tar hidden underneath the layers of water and moss. When it starts to burn, extinguishing it is nearly impossible. Always keep a safe distance from any swamp before starting a campfire. Another common mistake while breaking camp in the wild is not looking up. 
Let's say you found some solid ground to put up the tent, cleared it from all the nasty cones and stones, and made sure there aren't any anthills close by. You don't want anything to creep inside your sleeping bag at night, do you? The spot you've chosen is perfect, and the tree your tent is leaning to protects you from the wind and rain. You set up for the night, turning off your camping light, and suddenly, your tent is thrashing as if a wild beast has attacked you. Bewildered, you scrambled out and see a huge branch has fallen on top of your tent. The worst thing about this is that you would have seen it coming if only you'd looked up before setting up camp. Half-broken and rotten branches are easy to spot, and it's never a good idea to put your tent straight beneath them. Such a thing can break off at any moment, and you'll be lucky if it doesn't tear your tent and harm you. You know, crunch. Dozens of tourists make this mistake every year and often pay dearly for it. Looking up will also help you make sure there are no wasp nests or spider nets above you. These might prove even worse than a branch because wasps don't like to be disturbed and spiders may turn out to be venomous. Now, if you see a beautiful river and decide to break camp on its banks, pay special attention to where exactly you put up your tent as well. If you stay too close to the water, especially in spring or fall, chances are you'll find yourself afloat in the middle of the night. Always check the weather forecast for the day and the night after. If there's a chance of rain, better stay away from any bodies of water, especially rivers. The rain might raise the water level in it and make it burst its banks, drowning your little camp and ruining your vacation. But even if you're far from water, rain could spoil it for you. Say you're once again deep in the forest and tree crowns are protecting you from the weather. Precipitation still gets to the forest floor, but at least it's not as bad as in the open. The next night, when you set up camp in another place, you feel the ground is soft and springy. It's not a swamp, though, just the last night's rain has loosened the soil. If you're in such a spot, better move to somewhere solid. The thing is, soft and loose ground might start creeping out from under you at any point. This movement isn't as dangerous as when you're in a swamp, but the pegs of your tent might come loose too, and you'll end up buried underneath a pile of rugs that used to be your tent. And if you decided to set up your camp in a cozy-looking valley, and the rain starts falling when you're already there, well, prepare for a nice floating trip. All the water will naturally go down and into your shelter, eventually finding its way under your tent. No wonder you'll find yourself knee-deep in rainwater when you wake up. Oh, what a great spot for taking a bit of rest after a long walk. It's on a hilltop, so there's no water nearby, the sun's shining, and not a single tree to block it out. Sunbathing here's gotta be fabulous! Well, it seems this way for the first few hours. But when you stay here long enough, you'll see the error of your decision. Direct sunlight on your tent can make it hot in a matter of hours due to the materials it's made of. And you'll feel it on your skin as soon as you crawl inside. Let's just say you won't want to stay in there for long until it's night and the tent's cooled down at least. Same thing with the wind. In an open spot, gusts can reach crazy speeds. And if you haven't been careful while hammering down the pegs, you might say goodbye to your tent sooner than you'd like. It's best to find a spot near a tree that would protect you both from the sun and the wind. Still, don't get tempted to camp near a lone tree when the weather forecast isn't in your favor. Both sunny and rainy weather are okay, but if there's a serious storm coming, a single standing tree will serve as a lightning rod. It's not hard to imagine what may come if lightning strikes a tree you're camping under. Hey, you might get a charge out of it! When winter camping, the weather can be even more treacherous. Remember what I said about direct sunlight? Forget it. In winter, it's best to have the sun shining on your tent. The cold might get to you no matter how cool and expensive your tent is, and the winds are generally much more vicious in the cold season. Direct sunlight will help you cope with much of the cold. One of the more common mistakes hikers make is starting a campfire too close to the tent. Again, the material of the tent conducts heat very well, and it's a good thing when it's warm. But it also catches on fire easily. Sometimes, one spark is enough to burn your shelter to cinders. 
Make sure there's enough room between your tent and the campfire, and never leave your fire unsupervised. When you go to sleep, it's a rule to extinguish the fire so that you don't wake up to a blazing inferno around you. Insects can ruin even the most exciting hike. Mosquitoes, ants, ticks, and other pesky bugs can find their way into your tent wherever you are, so make sure you protect yourself from them. Use skin repellents when you go outside and put an anti-insect spiral next to the entrance to your tent. Don't put it too close or inside, though. The smell is irritating, and it can also cause a fire. To avoid the best part of mosquitoes, and especially ticks, try to stay away from lakes, ponds, and dense forests where swamps may occur. Skeeters reproduce in still water, so areas around such pools are replete with the winged pests. But they have a hard time flying when there's some wind, so choosing an open spot is your best bet to get rid of them. Don't let them bug you. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.